2008's Ao Oni was kind of a revolutionary game, for better or for worse. It was one of the earliest RPG Maker horror games to be released, so it set a lot of genre standards and inspired a lot of people. In 2013, the game got popular enough that the creator, No Props, had the opportunity to license out the property and expand the reach of the series. This is a pretty normal decision for someone in this position. Everyone's gotta eat, and this was a major opportunity for No Props. Because of this, the once simple game expanded into a multimedia franchise. There were books, films, television shows, you name it. Yet for some reason, there were no games. In January of 2017, that finally changed. Ao Oni 2 released to the public. If you don't know anything about the first game, I made a video talking about it that I'll link in both the description and the card. Now here's the fun part about Ao Oni 2. There's almost no information on it, at least for English speakers. I did some digging and uncovered some of the most insane nonsense that I have ever seen. The game is a mobile phone exclusive that was published by Litmus Company Limited and was developed by two companies, Um, yes that's their name, and Goodroid. Quick editing Ben interjection. I found something. You might be familiar with the name Goodroid. That's because they're the developers behind all of these games. These people are responsible for like half of the terrible mobile game ads that I see nowadays. They don't have the Aoni games listed on their developer pages on the app and Google Play Store, but the link in the App Store's description takes you directly to their website, so it has to be the same company. Litmus licenses and publishes all Aoni content, and they even have a form on their website where you can apply for character licenses or rent a Kigurumi. What the hell is a Kigurumi? Kigurumi. Oh my god, what is that? Um Incorporated is credited on the Aoni wiki as being a creator slash developer for Aoni Remake, Aoni 2, Aoni 3, Aoni Online, Aoni Gachikoa, and Aoni X. Goodroid is credited for developing Aoni 2, 3, and Online, as well as for publishing Aoni X. This begs the question, what the hell is any of that? I dug deeper. Aoni Remake is a mobile phone remake of the original game. Two and three are mobile-only sequels. From what I can tell, Aoni Online is a 100-player game of zombie tag, Aoni Gachikoa is a text-based mystery game that's also a mobile exclusive, and seems to be part of a genre called chat novels where you experience the story by reading fictional text history, then Aoni X has no information on it other than a singular VOD of a live stream I managed to find online. How long is this? Oh. My God. <laughs> I'm actually crying. I'm actually crying. <laughs> He's blue here. I guess that's the Kigurumi they were renting out to people. It seems that Litmus decided to convert Aoni into a mobile exclusive series, licensing the game out to small developers to rake in as much cash as possible. As far as I can tell, no props didn't help with development. Now while I would love to play through every single one of these insane looking games, only one of them has been translated to English, Aoni 2. It's a real shame, too, since this means I don't get to meet such interesting characters like Traveler and Girl while on an island infested with Onis in Aoni 3. Let's take a look at the synopsis for Aoni 2. Long ago, a certain school in the outskirts of town was suddenly closed. Nowadays, no one knows the reason why it was suddenly closed, but there was a certain rumor going around. They said that a blue monster appeared in that abandoned school building. I guess let's boot up the game? <laughs> it is an ad! We can stop playing this and just play Monopoly Go. This game is plagued with ads, so much so that I won't be putting up a full gameplay recording like I normally do. A lot of the ads were location-based, and I would really rather not dox myself through Ao Oni. There is always an ad at the bottom of the screen, even during gameplay. There are ads every time you save, every time you die, and there are pop-up ads that appear when you try and open up your inventory. So this game was clearly created to make as much money as possible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the game will be bad. Maybe the publisher required ads, but the developers put time and care into making a polished product. There's only one way to find out. When you enter the new game menu, you're given a choice between seven different characters, although six of them are completely blanked out. There are three new characters here, Teacher, Principal, and that one. Wonderful names. These options are complete lies. Once you beat the game, it just says coming soon next to every single one except for the dude at the very bottom. His name isn't translated here, but he looks like the Traveler on the Aoni 3 website, so we'll check that out after beating the main game. There's also a 3x speed and 5x speed mode that you have to pay money to unlock, so I will not be touching that today. Side note, why is this game played with your device vertical instead of horizontal? It's a lot less comfortable and it makes everything feel smaller, plus it makes it really 
really difficult to record. The game begins with a cutscene describing the situation. Hiroshi and his friends are venturing inside of an old abandoned school building. After they enter, their teacher follows. The synopsis I read earlier appears on screen during this section. I'm gonna make the assumption that this is some kind of alternate universe version of the same story, since every single one of Hiroshi's friends should be very dead right now. Immediately after entering the building, we cut to all five characters locked inside a decrepit jail cell. Hiroshi is just waking up, and his friends claim that they all simultaneously passed out upon entering the building, waking up here. The translation for this game is really bad. It got to the point that my friends and I stopped doing voices for the characters because it was so difficult to read out loud. No one told me that there's be a jailhouse here. What? You control Hiroshi by dragging your finger on the bottom half of the screen. It feels almost slippery to use, so you already know the chases are gonna be fun. To interact with objects, you simply face them and tap. The only thing to do here is to grab the jail cell key that's sitting not at all hidden directly on the bed and use it to free the group. I'm gonna try not to be too nitpicky with stuff like this since I want to give this game as fair of a shot as possible, even if so far it's been nothing but red flags. While the group expresses their confusion over entering a school and ending up inside of a jail cell, a loud shatter comes from a room to the left. This is exactly the same as in the original game, right down to the item that broke. Hiroshi heads forwards to check things out, finding a shattered plate on the ground. Can you at least share to Twitter? Can I share? <laughs> you gotta download this back, please! Get blue coins. Does this game have in-game transactions? Yes, it does. Oh no. Is there microtransactions in an out Oni game? <laughs> That's right, this game has more microtransactions than just the extra game modes. You can collect blue coins to spend on skins for the Oni to change his appearance. You can either pay for coins with real money or locate these glowing safes and watch a 30-second advertisement to get enough coins to win a skin. You don't get to choose the skin either, you have to open a loot box and gamble for it. We watched an ad to get a skin and I got this weird bat oni thing. I wanted to get more skins to see what kind of absurd nonsense there would be, but after the first time we got coins, the X button on ads completely stopped working, soft locking the game and forcing you to restart without getting any coins. Hiroshi finds a scrap of paper covered in graphite before returning to the original jail cell to find that everyone but Takeshi has disappeared. Takeshi whimpers that he saw it before scrambling away in a panic. Hiroshi enters the next room, pushing a chair up to a bookshelf and standing atop it to reach a key labeled Underground Archives. There's a locked door to the right that Hiroshi very subtly suggests might have something to do with the framed puzzle directly next to it. It's missing a piece, so we clearly need to go find it. Hiroshi uses his key on the locked door to the archive, finding himself in a library with the Oni inside. It walks upwards and disappears without posing any threat. I'm starting to notice a trend here. The plate, the library, this is just the same game as the original, but taking place inside of a school instead of a mansion. I'll keep mentioning them as they appear, but it seems like the development Developers just took all the things that people liked about the original, recreated them with less quality, and hoped it would get attention, which it did. These mobile games have over 4 million downloads. Hiroshi takes a nail puller from atop a table and the Oni spawns, chasing him out of the room. The infamous chase music is completely absent here, but I'm not entirely sure why. Other videos of the game online feature this music, but I didn't hear music at any point during the playthrough. I would have assumed that my phone was muted, but I could perfectly hear all the sound effects, just without the music, and the background music slide is maxed out. We're pausing again. Look at this. In the pause menu, original work, no props, sponsor, um, Dev Goodroid. So I guess um was just a sponsor and the proper developers of this are Goodroid? Hiroshi hides in a locker, showcasing something that I actually think is quite cool. There's custom artwork and animations for all the different locations that you can hide in. There is one thing that really detracts from hiding, and that's the suspense. In the original game, you would hide and rely on your hearing to decide when things were safe. In some versions, the Oni even faked the noises of leaving to lure you out. That meant that there was always some tension when deciding whether or not it was time to leave. In this version, you still get to listen to the sounds that the Oni makes, but when everything is safe, the game will automatically force you out of the locker, taking away all of the suspense. Hiroshi moves back to the room with the puzzle, using his nail puller on a boarded up door to the south. Inside is a completely empty hallway leading to a room with our very first and only functional glowing safe. That's to gamble? That's my gotcha machine to safe? If I click get, what do you think's gonna happen? This fabricated mobile phone advertisement has been sponsored by Gamersups. They have a delicious energy formula that has tons of vitamins, zero calories, is keto-friendly, and has caffeine-free alternatives. They even have ramen now. You're gonna need that formula to stay awake during our only two, you little dingleberry. Use code Ben again for 10% off your order. Don't hit that X button, you little ass. Guys, we got a blue coin 20 sheet obtained. 
No, don't give me notifications. What would, why would you ever need to notify me? Ben's asleep, he gets a notification, he oh, wakes up with his phone. The out only's like, I miss you. <laughs> Ignoring that, Hiroshi grabs a puzzle piece from the table and returns to the picture on the wall. This unlocks the door, leading to what actually looks like a school. This is when the maps start to get really big. One of the biggest issues I had with the early Aoni versions was the size of the map. There was no need to have a map that big with the amount of content in the game. And the sequel takes it up to 11. This place is an absolute maze, and half of it is completely empty. Hiroshi enters a lab area, noting a scale next to some colored blocks in various shapes and colors. The scale is only big enough for up to two blocks at the same time because Hiroshi is too stupid to rotate or stack them. The Oni appears once again, but the map is big enough now that there's no point in hiding unless there's a hiding spot within two or so rooms. It's just faster to run. It's also really easy to tell when it's over, since the menu buttons disappear for the duration of the chase. When they're back, you're set to go. For the rest of the game, 90% of the Oni chases will be entirely randomized. He can spawn anywhere, even if that means cornering you in a room where you can't outmaneuver him. The enemy AI is actually more efficient than in the original game, which can be really frustrating to work with using phone controls. These chases definitely feel cheap. One of the cool things about the original was that there were a few random chases here and there, but way more planned chases that were designed to catch you off guard. After like three attacks in this game, I just walked into every room completely ready for the Oni to spawn. And with how long these chases take, it just genuinely feels like padding. Hiroshi finds his teacher in the women's restroom, and she joins the party. They move to an extension of the lab area, finding a Bunsen burner and two models of the human body. Hiroshi spots that the right model's arm is broken, deciding to try and affix it to the left model. It fits, dispensing a cube of wax. In the nurse's office, there's a box with a connector that looks like it might be able to turn. Hiroshi won't turn it, though. Next to one of the beds, a memo is on the floor. It has three shapes on it alongside a weight in grams. This is for the scale puzzle from before. You need to take the blocks, look at their weights on the paper, then compare it to a scribble on a nearby desk. Put on the blocks that'll add up to the number of the scribble on the desk, and it will unlock. Well, something unlocks. We thought it was a door and didn't figure out that the drawer was open until far later in the game. Meanwhile, Hiroshi grabs an eraser and the paper from the start of the game, rubbing off the graphite to reveal some colored numbers. He heads to a nearby door that has the text green plus black scratched onto the surface. When you add the green and black numbers together and input it into the pad on the door, it'll unlock. This room has a key that ends up unlocking the cafeteria. There's something on the floor right near the entrance, but picking that up would be way too easy. We need to pad for time. A rat nabs the thing and runs into a huge kitchen area where he is easily caught netting us a lighter. This kitchen has tons of tables that you can move around, perhaps indicating a puzzle. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. They don't do anything. Hiroshi heads back, and the teacher panics when they reach the hallway. It's the Oni, for the fifth time since they teamed up. She runs away on her own this time for plot or something. It was at this point that my friends and I realized that the desk is what unlocked. It has ethanol inside that can be used to fuel the Bunsen burner. You use the lighter in the burner to melt the wax cube, freeing a small key from within. This unlocks a door to the south, leading to a hallway with a keypad on the wall. We wandered around for a while, eventually realizing that the box with the connector can be opened using a coin. There's a slide that can be viewed under the microscope, revealing the code that we used to progress. We were really getting sick of the puzzles at this point. Because of how spread out everything was in this needlessly huge map, they took a lot longer than they really needed to through travel time alone, which made things drag on quite a lot. This next area has a very damaged wall as well as a key mold. There's only one door here, and Hiroshi states that it's different from the others somehow, as if he needs to use something else to open it. I thought we could use a coil of wire from earlier to try and pick the lock, but using the wire results in Hiroshi bending it to fit into the shape of the key mold. We're gonna look past the fact that the wire that you can bend with your bare hands would in no way be strong enough to turn in a lock when shaped like this and just move on. This room has another gambling safe and nothing else. The following room, however, has Takeshi trembling inside of a closet. He gives Hiroshi a hammer before going back to hiding. This hammer can be used to break the decaying wall from earlier. Hiroshi finds a room with some bookcases that he somehow moves all on his own to reveal a hidden doorway that's covered by white paper of some kind. Oh look, you can move a bed to reveal a hole into the room below. We were doing good on original content for a bit there, but that's four things in a row taken directly from the first game. Hiroshi finds some detergent and a brush before hopping down the hole on the floor and instigating a chase with the Oni. This one has a mustache for some reason, and it never appears again. After escaping Pidoni, Hiroshi returns to the room and scrubs some gunk off the walls to reveal some arrows. This puzzle sucks. You're supposed to look at these arrows, walk over to these two computers, and interact with them in the same order that was indicated on the wall. This will give you a passcode to enter the door to the right. This wouldn't be a bad puzzle if it actually worked. We investigated these computers earlier, and they do not reset when you leave the room. We accidentally scrambled the combination by examining them earlier, rendering us completely stuck. By sheer luck, the combination reset a single time when we left the room. Every other time that we tried this, it did not work. We died like three minutes after entering that door and were reset to before the puzzle where we weren't able to get the combination to reset ever again, even when we recreated the circumstances exactly. I ended up stopping my recording so we could double check 
check the footage for the code just so we could continue. This hallway leads to a classroom with another damaged wall, which the Oni Kool-Aid man's through. Hiroshi snags a screwdriver from a desk and leaves, returning to a bathroom and removing the mirror with the screwdriver to uncover a key. This one leads to a balcony. Hiroshi walks past another gambling safe, locating Mika. Apparently Takaro told her to wait here while he looks for an exit, so that's what she's gonna do. This lines up with her description on the Aoni 2 website. Hiroshi leaves her, but not before grabbing a metal cylinder from this cabinet. This cylinder contains a painting of a famous musician. In the music room next door, Hiroshi hangs this poster in an empty frame, releasing a keycard. He grabs a snapped piano wire and uses it to rewire a card reader in the hallway. Does piano wire conduct electricity? Let's see. I would imagine it's, it's metal, from my understanding, but I don't know much. Piano strings are relatively poor conductors for electricity. And their resistance will quickly generate heat when a current is passed through them. So that thing should just explode or just catch on fire in a bit, then. Good. Maybe we'll die. So this game's supposed to be a, a direct sequel, right? Yes. Uh, what? 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 He spawned on top of me. Swiping the card gives Hiroshi access to a room with a crowbar that he uses to break down a door. The teacher is here asking about the others. Here you get to choose whether or not you want to join the teacher in checking in on Takeshi, or to continue searching for Takuro on your own. No matter what you choose, you're forced to look for Takuro. Gotta love the illusion of choice. Further down is a swimming pool full of dark liquid. Before Hiroshi can explore much, Mika screams. The Oni is chewing her face off, just like in the original game. She has a valve on her corpse that can be used to drain the pool. Inside the pool there's a key to a changing room, which has another absolutely awful puzzle. You need to get into this locker, but you don't know the combination. You need to look at the icon of a nearby backpack finding a four-digit code, but that code isn't what unlocks the door. To get the real code, you need to look at a thermometer on the wall that reads negative 10 degrees, then connect the dots and realize that you need to subtract 10 from the number on the backpack to get the code. This is insane. Did someone somehow break this mercury thermometer so that they could always have a little reminder of their locker code just in case they forget? Drawing the connection between between those two items did not occur to any of the four people in the voice chat. We had to Google it after wandering around for 20 minutes. The locker has a flathead screwdriver bit that Hiroshi uses outside. Where does he use it? Right here. Oh, you don't see it? Let me zoom in. That minuscule texture right there is a panel that you can unscrew to reveal a cup that you need to pour some of the pool water in. I could not see that on my phone screen, which makes me wonder more and more why this game has to be played vertically. Hiroshi fills the cup with water, causing a key to float upwards. This unlocks some double doors in the bottom left, leading to even more freaking rooms. The first one that we entered was a maze of beds and chairs. Hiroshi can move these beds around, but not freely. They have one predetermined motion that sometimes makes sense and sometimes doesn't. I may be wrong, but I would like to pose a theory. This bed can only be moved from the top, which is the most difficult way to move a bed. Grabbing from the side would be much easier, but nothing happens when you try to do it. I think that the developers didn't know how to program the bed moving backwards with Hiroshi's player model, so they did this as a shortcut. There's a locker key at the end of this room that Hiroshi can use to obtain a doorknob that he can then use on a room like five rooms back to get the boy's locker room key. Why? This is just so needlessly tedious, and every single puzzle seems to be more and more like this. It's just so boring and drawn out, and it gets more unbearable each time. There's stacks of whatever the heck these are in the two locker rooms. If you count the quantity in each stack, you get the code to the room in the same hallway. Takuro is here and he joins the party. Now that there are two people in the party, you can easily push this big rock out of the way of this door. Inside is the East Club Room Key. There's a winding tunnel here that's full of water. This is apparently where the pool water drains for some reason so we have to hit the valve again and refill the pool just to get to the end. That leads us to a power cord which can be used to power a device in the gym. The only numbers in this whole room are the scorecards on the wall, so we input that. Oh, yeah, because that just makes sense. What do I do? Where do I go? <laughs> Hiroshi input a careless answer, so that we put in the wrong answer. I'm not gonna ask. For most of this playthrough, we would be getting the same exact ad over and over for at least half an hour before it would rotate to something else. Usually it would be something like a local car dealership or Instagram, but this is actually the most effective way to ruin the vibe of your game, showing me this face every time that I save the game for 30 minutes. The East Club Room that we unlocked during that chase has a bug net and a color sequence on the wall, green, blue, yellow, red. The code we have to input into the device is how many of each of these colors appear on the floor of the gym. This earns us access to the West Club Room, containing half of a key. To get the other half of the key, you need to take the bug net, head to this room with a big gap in the floor, and reach over with the net to grab this shiny object. This unlocks the door at the top of the gym, leading to more 
doors. The first one leads to a courtyard with statues of the Oni. This statue has a little code written on it, and the room to the left has a pointy baton of some sort. In that walkthrough, how far into the video were you? Uh, that pool segment's 30 minutes in. Out of? An hour 13. If I asked you politely, would you fly here and kill me? I would fly over and hug you, I don't think I'd kill you. I'll do it. Since I've just learned that we're only like 60% of the way through this game, I'm gonna try and pick up the pace. The baton from earlier is used on this bookshelf to retrieve a winder. You have to use it on this tiny little hole in the side of the fountain, which is incredibly difficult to see at the original resolution. The code on the statue is step one, turn left three times. The rest of the code can be found scratched in the bottom of the fountain, but Hiroshi can't make out what it says, so he needs to cut his water bottle in half and use it as a hydroscope. But how does he cut it in half? There's a key on this bench that gets you into a room with a box cutter. It doesn't shine like every other item in the entire entire game and it blends directly into the seat. He puts the code into the well and the next set of rooms open. Takeshi is re-entered as Gymnast Arc and the room is full of the same nonsensical scribbles, a double rehash from the original game. Takeshi fumbles the landing and Hiroshi takes a key from him, using it to get a different key on the other side of the building. He jams it into the hole on this wall, opening another slot for the winder on the secondary fountain. The statue to the right turns into the Oni himself and a chase begins. This is the kind of stuff that I liked about the original. That was genuinely surprising. It's immediately offset by not giving us a puzzle to finish. The doors just open now. There was no need to make us retrieve the winder and put it into a new location if we weren't going to be winding anything. Oh no, stop it, help, damn it, hey over here, you monster, grah, everyone run away. He's gonna target me, <laughs> who could have predicted this? Something tells me you don't like this game. Whatever gave you that idea, Gino. I'm just sensing like negative vibes from you. So the teacher is dead up in a room with a jail cell. Looting her spawns the Oni and you can't lock the cell door yet. The death screens in this game usually have the exact same lines reused over and over again, but this one had a custom one so long that it was completely cut off by the box that it's in. Hiroshi manhandles another bookcase, finding a dice that has the number 6 written on it. There's also the same prison from the last game. Oh my god! Oh. After the chase ends, this room is entirely empty, both of enemies and substance. Next door, there's an 8 written on the wall as well as a lens sitting inside of a box. At this point, the game was actually starting to lag pretty badly. It was only for a few seconds at a time, but I genuinely do not understand how a 100 megabyte 2D mobile phone game could be performing this poorly. There's actually a second dice hidden in this room. It's under this bed, but you can't push it from the side that makes the most sense, even though there's a large gap behind it that would allow for it to be moved out of the way without it hitting Hiroshi. You have to move it from the top, like in the maze from before. Next, you're supposed to interact with this panel in the wall that blends in with the bricks because it's the same exact color. I'm getting really sick of how many of these assets just blend into one another, especially since I have to play this game on such a tiny screen. Remember the lens from earlier? If you examine the panel on the wall while looking through it, it reveals bright, glowing, invisible ink of a number on the left shape. The other three shapes mirror the layouts of the rooms with numbers inside of them, meaning inputting these digits will unlock the door. This leads to a church area where the Oni is being worshipped. There's this contraption in the middle that you can look through from all sides. It looks like you can put a mirror in the panels you see through the contraption, so we'll have to keep an eye out. Next door, there's a padlock on the floor and a box that reads, go south, then look north. We'll come back to this for later. For right now, we need to use this padlock to lock the cell door and loot the teacher. <laughs> Ow. The teacher had a straw doll on her that Hiroshi will need to burn to get to the item inside. But first, we found a share button. What is the- why? This game is too nerve-wracking, it's dangerous, semicolon three! <laughs> <laughs> Don't this die, Andrew, like, please. That looks like something I would say as like a joke. Oh yeah, man, please do Discord. Oh my god. Please put in the welcome. No! What is Freeform? New board. Agony. Oh, agony. <laughs> Did it I'm crash the game? Oh man, it really just crashed the game, huh? I just wanted to see if I could cheese coins. Ah, He's back. The burn doll somehow has an entire mirror inside of it. Since the message on the box read, go south, then look north, we place the mirror to the north. That way we can walk south, then look north. I believe that this is the result of a translation error. What you're supposed to do is go south, place the mirror, then look from the north. Don't look north, look south from the north. Absolutely idiotic. Somehow doing this reveals a code which unlocks the next wing of this ever-expanding building. Everything is older here and we even get to see Fuwari again. There are plaster busts all around the building with missing facial features that you need to replace. Hiroshi grabs a nose for later then enters this room. The Oni walks into the room below that you can see for some reason 
person, then turns to stare into the player's soul the second that they examine any object. There's a weird audio machine here that's missing a knob, but you can just find it in the urinal. There's also a newspaper for later. Hiroshi adds the knob, commenting that this is broadcasting equipment that can be used to play a sound in any room that he wants. On a whim, we chose the break room, which duplicates the Oni. The Oni was not supposed to be staring at us, he was supposed to move into the corner where the speaker played the chime so that we could sneak past him. There's a bust at the end of the hall that the plaster nose can be affixed to. It drops a plaster eye, so Hiroshi puts that in the one missing an eye. The final bust drops a key. Let's head through. That's just bullshit. Okay, new area, timetable on the floor, five buttons, diagram on the wall that matches the icons on the timetable, the diagram matches the positioning of the buttons, we need to figure out what day it is so we know what buttons to press in what order. We find a dead phone, then a room with three windows. This room has a panel needing a four digit code. The center window is caked in grime, so we had to scrub it off using a newspaper. Since there were only three windows, we figured the dirt was telling us where to focus. That was not the case. We sat here looking at this window for ages with absolutely no idea how to interpret a code from it. After like 20 minutes of confusion, we just googled it and moved on, still having no idea how the windows were supposed to give us the code. Two patrons in my Discord server ended up figuring out the solution way later on. We were supposed to count the trees in each window to get parts of the code, although there were only three windows. The fourth window is in a completely different room. Now that I understand that, I actually kind of like this puzzle, but I do wish it was a little bit more consistent. Either have all the windows in different rooms, or none of the windows in different rooms. Heck, even having it split 50-50 would make more sense than 25-75. We put that code into the keypad on the wall, getting a battery for the phone. Hiroshi doesn't call for help, instead checking what day it is so he can complete the timetable puzzle from before and know what buttons to press. This unlocks a room with some lighter fluid. Hiroshi refills his lighter, then heads into a dark room to try and illuminate it. He lights all the candles in all four corners. Only after all four are done does the room become entirely visible all at once. We pause the game for a second here. For some reason, this causes the lights to dim and a wooden block to appear. I could not tell you why, so we just moved on and jammed this wooden block into a horse statue in the art room. Room. This gets us a key so we can go to another section of this godforsaken school. Oh heck and gee whiz guys, it's Takaro. He joins the party and we head up the stairs to the roof. This door is worn down but stuck in place, so we need to use the crowbar. Oh look, an original jump scare that functions perfectly. So Takaro turns into the Oni in the party section of the pause menu, but he doesn't even attack you until you use the crowbar, then he spawns on the other side of the room and then you have to escape him. Why is they keep rehashing everything? Finally, we get to the roof. This is the end game. We are almost done with this absolute travesty. There's a bunch of switches and some doors. One room makes you move another bed to reach an underground area with three switches and a lever on the wall. One of the switch pedestal thingies is missing a button, so Hiroshi takes the lever from the wall and heads back upstairs, placing it in an indent in a separate room. One of these huge containers has a color sequence painted on the side. It's the same number of images in the same position as the switches below, but those only have two options, on and off. But we have three colors to work with. What you're supposed to do is use the lever to power on the grid of switches. Then you use the lens from way earlier on the three colored diagrams to reveal the actual positions of the switches, as well as three others. On the right side of the roof, there's a little black speck on the wall. This conceals a red ball, which apparently acts as the final button for those pedestals in the basement. We then use the same diagram from earlier and put in the code using the red, blue, and yellow buttons. The first time we did it perfectly, and it did not work. The second time, we did it perfectly again, and it did work. I double checked the footage, and we did the exact same thing both times. Inputting this sequence nets us the key to one final room. It has three levers, the last three things we saw with the lens earlier, which we can then input to unlock the gate at the very top. Hiroshi stumbles into a winding corridor that quickly fills with Onis. He weaves through it towards the exit, escaping the building. The Oni gives up real quick after that, and we get an epilogue with overlapping text. But we aren't done yet. We need to try the Traveler's scenario. Nothing here is translated, but we decided to give it a shot anyways, just to see how far we could get. The only item in this entire building was a box cutter labeled key. It does not work on anything. We interacted with every object and every door. I think that's as complete as the bonus scenario is gonna get. That was one of the worst games I've ever played. It was an inferior rehash of the original game, plagued with advertisements, in-app purchases, terrible controls, and puzzles that either made no sense, dragged on for too long, or both. I experienced the same emotions playing this game as I did when I beat the original Alone in the Dark, even though Aoni 2 released over two decades later. It was boring, unpleasant, not at all scary, and just overall a complete waste of time. Even if the rest of the games were translated, I wouldn't go anywhere near them. It's 
genuinely not worth it. It's so sad to see a game that I grew to really enjoy get destroyed like this. Sure, the original had its hiccups during the early phases, but it turned into a fairly solid game. I don't know if No Props teamed up with Litmus to expand the Aoni Empire or if they just sold the rights. Either way, it's terrible to see what the series turned into. Aoni 2 is a shameless imitation, and you're better off playing the original. I'll be leaving the link to the original in the description below, as it's the only one worth your time. I hope to see you all again, hopefully after playing a better game.